All right. Health assessment chapter one. Woohoo! Who's excited? I'm excited to talk incessantly. You're excited to put me on speed volume because I talk kind of slow because I need to. So let's do this thing. This is chapter one of health assessment and we will quickly dive into what it is to understand health assessment and health promotion and why is that important into your nursing career. I will give you a hint. It is because everything begins and ends with health assessment. Honestly, it does. So pay close attention to the things I say. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking about things, but I want to give you a real world view of what happens around me. And I am blatantly honest. So some days I am going to make you really excited about nursing and perhaps other times I'm going to make you feel very nervous about nursing, but good, bad, or indifferent, I'm always going to give you accuracy. So don't fear, you're going to do well, you're wired for the stuff, you just haven't figured it out. And if you have, good for you, you're already a step above the rest. So let's go ahead and start moving and shaking. All right, so health assessment is the basis of everything that we do. So um, health assessment is uh, analyzing data, creating a plan of care, um, and those plans of care are um, regulated uh by the American Nurses Association. So their job is, they're like the hall monitors of the whole school um, is the best way I can define it because their job is to see what's happening all around them from a nationwide perspective and make sure that everyone is uh, putting plans and positions in place to give the most efficient, uh, most effective, most safe patient care. So uh, we actually have a chapter here with the ANA and we work on uh, community outreach for students uh, who are struggling with homelessness, domestic violence, um, just managing things in general. Uh, so if you guys would like to be a volunteer, let me know because I um, am spearheading that uh, coming back into effect um, immediately. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what this slide says and I think we can move on to the next one. All right, I want you to stop what you're doing, get your pen and paper, because we're gonna have to write some stuff down here. So the basic components of health assessment, this is gonna be 50% of your test, I swear. At least I feel like it was 50% of our test last time. I haven't looked at our exam yet. So this is gonna be the idea of your history and your physical examination. Your history is considered subjective data. Let me slow this down for a bit because subjective data is the data that you collect from a patient that is subject to be a lie. That is how I remember this. It is subject to be a Krakow you know what. Okay. Well, why would a patient lie? <laughs> why wouldn't a patient lie? It happens all the time. Part of who we are is we're detectives. Part of what nursing is, is a detective. Case in point, I get an alcoholic. I have to ask them how much they drink. What do you think they tell me? Well, I only have one drink. Really? Because your blood alcohol content is nearly 480. That's lethal. <laughs> That's lethal. <laughs> right? I don't know what drink that was, but it must have been in a fishbowl. I don't know what to tell you. Like, th these are the things that happen. So, again, uh, another one. Oh, yeah. So, a lady. How much do you weigh? This is without me, you know, having having taken their weight. Oh, I don't know. Um, that would be the equivalent of me going, I don't know, like 180 pounds, which we all know is clearly not the answer because I am far more than 180 pounds. Same concept. Okay. Subjective data. It's subject to be fake. All right. Physical examination or what they call objective data is not fake. This is hard evidence. So I have a creatinine of 2.26 or I'm 76 years old. Or I weigh 98.6 kilograms, right? These are documented data from, you know, from medical equipment that has been patented, that has been, you know, approved, put out on the market and sold. So this information is, has a very low risk of being fake information. All right. So objective data, subjective data. Please get those two in your brain correctly. We're going to continue to talk a lot about it as we go along. This, again, I feel like it's 50% of your examination, if I'm not mistaken, and they haven't, they haven't changed my opportunity to make it that way because this is such a big deal, all right? 
So components of health assessment. Now, data collection, again, we're going to go back to subjective objective. Data collection is everything. Um, a lot of times you'll have objective data that can mean a lot of things, and it's not until we get to the subjective data that we realize, okay, we have a full picture. So case in point, um, my patient clinically uh, is showing that they are dehydrated, all right? So... I, it could tell me a lot of things. I could be dehydrated because I have an ileus and I'm not eating. I could uh, be dehydrated because I'm a marathon runner and I haven't been properly hydrating like I'm supposed to. Or it could be that I, you know, am, have suicidal ideation and the thought of me getting up to feed myself, I don't feel like I deserve that. Right? So... It's when we get to that subjective data that we find out what's really wrong with the person a lot of times, okay? Subjective data is, in many ways, uh, more important than clinical objective data. Um, so, yeah, very important that we get these two separated so that we do really well in the first exam. Cool? So again, we're talking about documentation of data, which lets you know how important documentation is from a lot of different areas. I need, as a provider, to see what's been going, out, going on throughout the day, because whereas you have four patients, I have 25 patients, and I'm trying to regulate all 25 of them as things are dropping left and right. So I rely heavily on your data because you're there the whole time. Right. Does that make sense? So when your doctors, when you call them and um, you get frustrated because they ask about the patient's name and what's going on and they ask you to jog their memory really quick, it's because you have four patients and we do continuity of care. At least we used to. Um, uh, so we have this patient theoretically for three and four days at a time. And a doctor has a patient set that he gets for seven days square. And his job is to get them in and push them out so that we can get more in, right? So their life is completely different. So try not to get so frustrated with them when they get frustrated at you. Because they're not getting frustrated at you. They're getting frustrated at the lack of time that they have to pay attention to these patients. And it's projected out in a way that makes you look like you've done something wrong. But trust me, that's not the problem. The problem is what's at the back end of their world. So make sure that you get that data documentation for them because nine times out of 10, they're sitting next to a computer and they're literally going with 15 screens up because I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Um, you're looking at 15 different patients and you're tracking your data along to make sure that nobody's missing anything or that no one's gonna basically fall out all right so data collection it is process of evaluation it's nursing notes right it's got to be accurate it's got to be concise you got to really pay attention to it don't do that thing that all nurses do where they literally just copy copy ed, epic charting every four hours over and nothing has changed and if it is it's something stupid because as a seasoned nurse, I can look at that and go, I'm not buying any of this for a dollar. This is whack. Patients change throughout the day. Like, it, it's a thing. So if I see that everyone's been fine all the way down alert and oriented, boom, 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 same charting every four hours on a med surge unit, I know that I can't trust that nurse. So don't be that person, please. Make sure that you document appropriately and don't just fudge numbers because it's easy because it is a it, it's a problem in nursing i mean it really is so the amount of information gained during a health assessment depends on several factors so what does that mean that means the um, amount of information that you gain through your chat with your patient is loosely going to be based off of the level of expertise that you carry within you your needs for your patient and your context of care. Now, what does that mean? What that means is, is if you have the ability to communicate with your patient appropriately, um, the information that you gain is going to be far, far greater in value than if you have the inability to appropriately communicate with them. So the drive home motivator and the drive home understanding they want you to have for this slide is that the more... Um, the more you build a bond with your patient, nine times out of 10, the more appropriate 
um, you were going to have, uh, or the more appropriately, you were going to have a bigger picture of what is going on with them from the inside out, if that makes any sense. Take heed to this first sentence. Um, I believe I've seen that sentence verbatim somewhere. Um, and I believe it's related to your exam. So please understand this concept and please understand what exactly this sentence means from an internal perspective um, because there may or may not be something, I'm almost positive there's something um, that is related to this idea in this slide. So context of care uh, has to do with the circumstances behind why we're doing what we're doing from a healthcare delivery approach. Um, so it has a lot to do with um, their environment, their setting of their situation within the home. So uh, here's a prime example. I get a patient who has fallen multiple times at home um, and has a wife who uh, is wheelchair bound. And, you know, the patient takes care of both of them, but has been falling a lot. So uh, that would be the context behind the circumstance of the patient. So in my brain, when I'm thinking about healthcare delivery, I'm thinking, okay, well, did they, did they have an aneurysm? Do they have a bleed in their head? Do they break anything? All right, well, no and no. All right, cool. So then how do I prevent this person from falling again? Because we have a theme. Well, what's, call it, what's causing the, the massive amounts of falls? Well, I just saw that they got blood pressure meds a month and a half ago, and they just increased their dose three weeks ago. And then that three weeks they've been falling usually happens in the morning time. Okay, cool. So I've realized that they're getting orthostatic hypotensive, and that's why they have multiple falls first thing in the morning because your blood pressure um, is usually lower because you're laying down flat and your blood pressure is lower because it's at a lower gradient. So yeah, blood pressure is the problem, medication is the problem. So my plan of care is gonna be to hold that medication first thing in the morning. Or rather than taking it you know, uh, within the first hour of waking up, I'm gonna have them take it within the first four hours of waking up. That would be the context of care. I hope that made sense to you guys. So when we're talking about the types of assessments, these are pretty important because you're going to hear us say comprehensive health assessment, and that's what you would call a traditional head to toe. Um, there is a problem based or what they call a focused health assessment. So basically, as a nurse, when you come in, um, you would do your comprehensive health assessment or your head to toe. Uh, you'd want to get that done by 9 o'clock and have it documented uh, prior to that time frame. So, like, I usually don't get my stuff done sometimes, depending on what the situation is, until 10 or 11. Uh, but when I started that process is when I started documenting that, that, that whole situation so that we keep our time correct. If I'm in that room at 8.98, or 8.98, if I'm at, in that room at uh, 8.58, then 858 it is. Um, is it always going to be perfect? No. Sometimes I just give it a 945 and I'm done. Um, but that would be your head to toe. That's the the whole shebang bang And then from there, every four hours on a regular med surge unit, you would then do a problem-based or focused health assessment. Uh, in ICUs that I usually stay in, um, it usually is uh, head to toe. Uh, every four hours and then an hour focused assessment because you got to watch those guys a lot sooner. Sometimes it's every half hour, sometimes it's 15 minutes. It just depends. Now, an episodic assessment would be a patient has a seizure or a patient codes. Okay, I'm going to have to document that. I'm only going to have to do it once, but I'm going to have to do it very intensively, and I'm going to have to do a one-time documentation on that disorder, whatever that looks like. So if it's a code, it's code charting, right, which is very simple to do in EPIC system. Um, if it's a seizure, then we would use a seizure panel. If it was, you know, a potential for a stroke because they had some weird signs and symptoms of asymmetry of the face, I would use an NIHSS system um, and do an NIHSS assessment one time and then wait for a doctor to give me another order to continue to do it every two hours, you know, blah, 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 blah. But that would be an isolated incident, whereas a screening assessment is going to be, I'm screening for problems like suicidal ideation. We do this uh, in your admissions assessment downstairs in the ER, um, and then you have to do it as part of our admissions assessment when you get onto whatever unit. We have to do it again. 
So this would be the uh, how do you feel about this, never, always, sometimes type of a screening assessment uh, that we do. Like, have you had any suicidal um, thoughts? Have you had any suicidal or homicidal ideation? Have you thought about hurting yourself or others type of a deal? Um, that would be screening for something bigger. Okay, so patient needs. Type of health assessment performed by the nurse is driven by the patient's need. Yeah, I would certainly hope so. I would certainly hope if somebody um, is, you know, breathing and wheezing through the hallway and it's bubbling, that you're not checking their toes <laughs> for diabetic ulcers. So yeah, we we take our assessment and we base our assessment on what the patient needs. Very simple. Um, I believe you may need to know that simple sentence, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, nurses must be prepared to conduct appropriate level of assessment. I, yeah, of course. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be on that unit. Why are these slides giving us common sense information? All right, patient's age, general level of health, presenting problems, knowledge level, and support systems are among the variables that impact patient need. Well, yeah, of course they do. Um, so basically, this slide says, hey, if you're old versus young, it's going to affect the way we need to take care of you. So I didn't know if you guys were aware of that, but if you are not, please understand that, you know, we need to know what type of assessment to give what type of patient and um, it, someone's health is going to affect how we help them. So yeah, that's, I'm done with this slide. We can move on to the next one. <laughs> Sorry guys. So the expertise of the nurses gain with specialization within a given area of practice. This is a common, uh, a common thing that happens, yeah, and I see we want you to have a specific expertise. A lot of times they want you to have ACLS or PALS, um, some other certification, NIHSS, things of that nature, uh, which is going to be stroke certified, ICU nurse. Um, I have all those certifications. Uh, it's just a, a, a basic level of understanding that goes beyond uh, the level of a typical med surge nurse, although some do have ACLS and PA, uh, PALS as well. Um, it loosely is based off of, you know, time and grade, what the, what the need is, et cetera, et cetera. So a nurse who is in an, an intensive care unit um, has specific expertise related to being an ICU nurse. Um, just like a labor and delivery nurse is going to know differently than an ortho nurse or a bariatric nurse. So expertise does not make you an expert in all fields, um, but it does give you an identifier that shows a level of expertise that is supposed to be the minimum requirement. So please understand that that is basically what that means. I mean, we wouldn't stick a uh, patient who is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, we wouldn't necessarily stick them on a trauma unit, we would probably stick them on a neuro unit if we had the availability before we would take them to trauma. Um, unless it was something that needed to be done traumatically, which is probably going to be a hemicranny, which goes straight back to neurosurgery. So that's kind of how that works and that's kind of what the slide means. So I think we can move on to the next one. So reasoning and judgment the first sentence is what I need for you to pay attention to or maybe write down. The nurse must analyze and interpret data before initiating a plan of care. Really? Uh, the cook should read the cookbook before trying a new recipe. For real? Is that how that works? As silly as it sounds, this is a concept that you may be tested on, right? So just make sure that you understand that concept. And basically, the bottom slide or the bottom part of the slide says... Uh, the idea of a health assessment and a plan of care is going to be a, a big picture painted of all the dividing factors that creates the disease process of the patient and the way we're going to have better cl clinical outcomes uh, and better healthcare outcomes once they get back home. That's all that that means. So again, I feel like this is pretty straightforward. Um, be warned, I have one child walking on top of me trying to pet a cat and I have a cat that is in my ear so you may hear purring in or yelling or yipping here in the next couple of seconds because this is going to probably go bad. Um, so organization and clustering of data. That's important for data organization so that you can put the same collective data together and look at them to see a pattern. Uh, specifically, we do that with oxygenation with our heart monitors, right? Um, we do it, again, for cardiovascular things like EKGs. We'll put those next to our other data that talks about our lipid panel so we can all kind of correlate it together with your troponin. Um, 
And that's basically what the slide says. Just keep your data clustered together in a way that it makes it easier for you to interpret what's going on with the patient and how we fix it because it saves time. That's all. All right, data analysis, interpretation, and clinical judgment include identifying abnormal findings. Well, sure, those are in red. Those are pretty easy to see. Uh, correctly interpreting findings to select appropriate plan of care. Yeah, we need to be able to look at those findings and establish, hey, blood sugar of 683, bad. Uh, no more diet. No more food. Uh, MPO except for water and insulin drip. Yep, there's that. Uh, applying clinical judgment to interpret or make conclusions regarding the patient needs, concerns, or health problems. Sure, of course we're going to do those things because we are not going to then go, hey, your blood sugar is 683. Why don't you go ahead and get four ice creams for your diabetic diet? We're just going to change you to a diabetic diet and that's going to solve all the problems of the world. No, um, because they're clearly going to have some concerns about that if they're cognizant at that point with such a high blood sugar. Um, after understanding the situation, the nurse responds by determining appropriate interventions. Yeah, again, that insulin drip is going to be our appropriate intervention. Uh, that diet change to NPO status is going to be an appropriate intervention. That blood glucose Q1 hour is going to be an appropriate intervention related to that. This slide just reiterates the basic idea of everything begins with health assessments, and that's why this class is so important. That's why I'm going to teach you a ton. Um, and that is why I am going to give you basically a brain load of information so that it becomes uh, easier for you to understand as you continue along this process of understanding the idea of medicine and what that means for you and your role as a nurse. So uh, this class in a lot of ways is your easiest class because you're going to do a fabulous job and have a fabulous grade. Um, but it's going to be very difficult in that you're going to have to take the brunt of the rewiring that I'm going to be doing with you that kind of makes you understand the language of medicine. All right, so definitions of health promotion and health protection. Health promotion is behavior motivated by the desire to increase well-being and actualize health potential. Know that definition. Health protection is behavior motivated by desire to avoid illness, detect illness early, and maintain, maintain function when ill, okay? So what's more important, health promotion or health protection? Ooh, this is always a good debate. Health promotion, in my opinion, is 10 times more effective than health protection. Why? Well, health protection avoids illness, it detects illnesses early, and it maintains function when ill, but if you're never ill in the beginning because you have good health promotion, then you don't have to worry about getting to the next step. Got it? So behavior motivated by the desire to increase well-being and actualize health potential, what that means is this is living my best life. And part of that um, health promotion is eating healthy, living healthy. Uh, having mindful meditation, good self-care. Um, part of self-care is doing your annual physicals to make sure that things aren't off, getting your labs done to make sure we're not missing anything, something isn't looking sus, that type of a deal. So health promotion is far more important. Health promotion for nurses is everything. You have the ability, my soon-to-be nurses, to transmute your energetic pattern into somebody else. I'm going to explain in a second. Let me keep going. And that ability to keep them motivated is going to be the reason that they live longer and healthier and happier. So not only do people live and die by our hands, that is a metaphorical live and die too. Because if you have 20 terrible years of life versus five amazing years of life, what would you choose? What would you choose? I would choose the five years of an amazing life because I'm not going to be miserable for 20 years. You can't make me. I've been miserable for half of my life for random reasons that don't even matter anymore. And ever since, you know, I turned 20 and moved on and got past all of that, you know, life has been getting consistently better. So a lot of that are motivators that keep me going. And those motivators are the happy people around me. 
So as a nurse, it's even more important because you have the ability to tell these people that they do need to fight for their life and they will fight for their life. And they will realize that the first time they ever lived is when they were told that they were dying. How poetic and perfect is that? That is what you're going to do. That is your ability to transmute negative energy and turn it into positive energy. And I'm here to tell you, friends, life, this world around us that we understand, all of the things included, are all based on four simple concepts. Energy, frequency, vibrational pattern, and balance. So if you understand that, you understand medicine. If you understand that, then you understand the basic concepts of life. Here's a basic concept of life. Uh, what do plants need in order to survive? They need CO2. And what is their byproduct? Their byproduct is oxygen. That's what they, that's what they push out. Well, what do we need to survive? Oxygen. And what is our byproduct? Oh my God, it's CO2. Right. That's how that works. Because there is a balance in this world. Okay. If you believe in a creator, whoever your creator is, your creator created balance in this world. So if you understand the balance of medicine and two very simple concepts, you will understand how to take care of your patient, whether you know what's going on with your patient or not. I will teach you this. Uh, more than likely it's going to be exam two. I don't want to give you too much too soon. But yes, behavior uh, that is motivated by the desire to increase well-being and actualization and actualize health is going to be your gift to humanity. You're going to be an internal light that guides these people to the shore safely. You're the lighthouse. That's how this works. So you have to hold yourself with a certain type of quiet confidence, right? You have to hold yourself to a higher standard, right? You can't look sluggish. You got to keep your shoulders back. You got to keep your chin at the level uh, between the floor and the ceiling, right? You can't have it thrown up in the air because you're better than everybody. And you can't be looking at your feet because you're no confident. I can't have no confidence, people. It doesn't work. So... What do you do? Well, you stand your ground. You understand. You gain intellectual knowledge. Knowledge is power, my friends. If you know information and you are confident in that knowing, you were unstoppable. That is how this works. This world's actually very simple. We create our own complications that make it difficult. So, know your two definitions here. Keep paying attention to the things that I say because it's going to segue into our next class. All the little concepts that I'm throwing about left and right. And let's go to the next slide because I think I've exhausted this one. Okay, so three levels of health promotion. These three levels we need to know. So primary is preventing uh, disease from developing through pr promoting healthy lifestyles. So primary Daddy, prevention. Daddy. Yes, Athena. Daddy. I'm sorry, what? Are you done? I think we're done. Okay. So apparently she was just telling you immunizations is a classic primary prevention example. Um, that is the most common example of primary prevention. Secondary prevention. Uh, so let me go back to primary prevention really quick. Here's how I remember primary prevention. Primary prevention means my body is not damaged. I don't know what's wrong with me, but nothing could be wrong with me because nothing has been wrong with me and I want to never let anything happen to me. So that's why we say immunizations because it covers a lot of ground. Secondary means I have something wrong with me, but what I have wrong with me, I can actually fix based off of lifestyle and then go back to not having anything wrong with me. So um, obesity causes type two diabetes and a lot of people are borderline diabetic. Okay, so this would be secondary promotion. This would be me teaching you how to eat healthy and have a better lifestyle so that your blood sugars go lower, you lose weight, and you no longer have a borderline diabetic body. Okay, that's secondary prevention. So secondary is I just got a process, but I can turn it back around if I do the right things. Now, tertiary prevention means there's no going back. I've got this disease process. Now I'm just trying to live my best life with what I got. So I've got COPD. That sucks. 
I'm never going to get that lung capacity back. But what I can do is I can learn how to not overexert myself and I can learn ways to get the best breath I can get for as long as I can get it um, to prevent further injury of those lungs. Does that make sense? So a uh, tertiary prevention example would be when the heat index is over 90, I'm not going to go outside because I have COPD and that's going to make it harder on me. I'm going to stay inside and I'm not going to collect a lot of dust around my house because that would be an irritant to the lungs. That would be tertiary prevention. Okay, I think I got this figured out. You are going to be tested on these. There's going to be several questions about these, so please know what the differences are and what kind of screening. If you see the word screening, it's almost always primary. Okay. Um, if it is a diabetic problem or it is a uh, overweight problem, it's usually secondary related. And if it's, you know, a disease process that's just bad, uh, it's usually a tertiary. So just keep an eye open for those. And I'll get into that a little bit more in depth as we move along. All right. So healthy people is actually 2030, not 2020, but whatever, I'll keep it. Um, so the objectives are four principles. It's the same four principles regardless. It's always been the same four principles. Um, give high quality care uh, so that people live longer and uh, are free from diseases. Uh, achieve a holistic level of health to include all groups. Um, create environments that promote health for everyone equally. Um, and promoting quality of life over quantity and healthy development um, across the lifespan. So from young to old. So that might be a part of one of your questions. I would just look over the concepts and understand them and probably move forward because healthy people 2030 or 2040 or 29,000 is always going to be a thing. Um, and the goals really don't change that much. So they just make a small addendum and act like it's a new thing. Uh, this one's going to include a lot of COVID based stuff. So that would be cool. But uh, by and large, they're all the same. Uh oh. All right, so let's do this question really quick. A mother of three is being seen for a screening assessment while planning the initial part of this visit with the patient. The nurse needs to ensure that uh, the patient receives a refill for her thyroid medication. Well, that doesn't make any sense because we're talking about a patient that's being seen for screening. So anyone who's getting screening isn't going to be a primary provider, so A doesn't matter. The patient is instructed on preventative measures for hypertension. Hmm. We're screening, and if we're screening, that means that we wouldn't have hypertension. We would have nothing. We're trying to see if you have something. So if we are instructing preventative measures on hypertension, that's a secondary, not a primary prevention. So that's a no-no. Other family members are present during the interview. That's got nothing to do with nothing. Um, so that doesn't matter. And information about the patient's lifestyle habits is gathered. Yeah, because we're screening. So anytime we screen, we have to get information about the patient's lifestyle. So uh, I'm going to say D is the answer because, well, D is the answer. Um, so that's kind of how that question rolls. Our triggers to let us know what they were looking for is the word screening. Screening means primary prevention. So if I have a screening assessment, it's primary. The only thing I'm going to be doing is collecting data about their, their lifestyles. Yeah. So there's that. And then let's do another question. Yeah. So this is the answer, uh, D, um, which is, uh, making sure that we find out their lifestyle habits and, and choices, uh, because we're talking about screening. All right, and then this is the type of style of question we're going to have. So a nurse is assessing a female teenager. The nurse asks the young woman to bend over and touch her toes. The nurse assesses for the curvature of the spine as a means of detecting scoliosis. Assessing the curvature of the spine is an example of, uh, let's see, health education? Nope. Primary prevention, secondary prevention, or tertiary prevention? Now. The nurse is assessing the curvature of the spine as a means of detecting scoliosis. Okay. Assessing the curvature of a spine is an example of, now you're going to want to say that this is primary prevention, but if I have a positive patient, that means they have scoliosis. So we screen them early to detect scoliosis. And if I detect scoliosis in a patient, 
then that is going to be secondary prevention. I know you're thinking I'm crazy right now, but I swear it is. Okay. And yes, when the nurse assessed the curve, assessed when the nurse assessed the curvature of the spine to understand that that was indeed scoliosis, that gave them the disease process. Can I reverse scoliosis? Technically, yes, you can um, through braces and whatnot. And there are procedures now that can actually fix a completely crooked back um, that are pretty complicated. So yeah, that they already have it. If they already have it and it can be reversed, it's going to be secondary prevention, and it is.